it's my pleasure, great honor to introduce my fellow panelists today. Aniko Sombati, uh, uh, Managing Director for Digitalization, Hungarian National Bank. Uh, we have Chris Matheisen also with us in person, um, CEO, Managing Director of Microsoft Hungary. We have on the screen Tor Torbjörn Fredriksen from Jungtad. Those who were um, here from the beginning of the day, you might have heard his excellent presentation on Jungtad's greatest study um, on the data flows and international data flows. Um, we have also Levante Janos Kuti with us from McKinsey and, um, and uh, Martin Kevats, who is the National Digital Advisor for Estonia, but um, actually he's virtually the CIO of Estonia, if I may say so. So um, welcome everybody. Uh, we will speak about how to maximize data, data assets and AI uh, for our business, for our countries, and how to keep competitive. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to uh, hearing about all the international examples as well as what we have already seen in Hungary and what we have already experienced in Hungary. Um, we thought it might be best to, to start with a little bit of warm-up and ask um, Levente Janos Kuti to, um, to discuss that. A couple of thoughts from a consultancy. So over to you, Levente. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dora. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm uh, uh, I'm really missing to see the audience, but uh, at the same time, it's great that uh, I can participate uh, despite uh, not being able to there in person. So I think that's uh, great, especially for digital discussion and that we are planning to do today. Uh, I actually try to share my uh, keynote presentation. So please let me know if you see it or. Can yeah. you see it? Yes, we can. Yes. Excellent. Very good. So when it, it's a great honor and pleasure to be with you here and uh, obviously digitization, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, this is an amazing topic that uh, we as McKinsey, we are dealing a lot with. And uh, when I was thinking about this uh, afternoon and the discussion, I thought maybe the best is uh, to share with you a couple of insights of our Digital Challenger report, which is uh, a report that we have not started yesterday, but we have started already a couple of uh, years ago and uh, uh, which we actually pointed uh, to understand a bit better the outlook for Central Eastern European countries especially. But before I would jump into uh, Central Eastern European countries, and now I try to move, and it moves, I think. I hope you can also see it. Yes. So in this report, we actually created uh, three groups of uh, countries uh, based on where they stand in terms of digitization. There was clearly one very important group covering like 60 million people in uh, 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 out of uh, the European Union, who are what we call digital front runners. So mainly the uh, northern countries, Benelux countries, and uh, we are lucky enough because uh, we have also one of their representatives here to, today with us, uh, uh, who is uh, who will I'm sure talk a lot about uh, Estonia because Estonia is one of the countries from CE who could qualify into this distinguished uh, group of uh, front runners who are the most advanced, most innovative uh, in this uh, in this regard. Then we have the next uh, group, which is a large one, the big five countries uh, with more than 300 million people. They are already at a quite good level of uh, digitalization, but they are not extremely fast movers. Uh, they are decent. And then we have uh, the digital challengers, uh, which is most of the countries from uh, CE. And uh, the characteristic of this group, uh, as we found that uh, five, six years ago, is that we are having a great opportunity. And uh, the great opportunity lies in the fact that if we talk about numbers, then uh, we have the chance to grow our digital economy uh, tremendously. And uh, the way how we highlighted that a couple of years back, it was that 
assuming that we can catch up and uh, aim for the digital front runners uh, performance, then we could, by 2025, we could reach twice as uh, a big uh, digital economy in, in, in our region than we would uh, be able to do uh, otherwise if we would just go with the kind of uh, estimated uh, business as usual growth rate. Now, the less good news is that if we look at this uh, uh, journey after four or five years, so after first half of this period, we are not very far from the business as usual uh, journey. Uh, and um, it's very clear that something needs to be done or needed to be done. And then COVID hit in. And uh, I think COVID is an amazing uh, opportunity for that uh, uh, group of uh, challenger countries because it changed many things on the uh, on the map and uh, if we look a little bit on the numbers i think we can clearly see that some of the myths that we like to echo many times before covid are just seriously challenged and uh, cannot be maintained anymore so if, if we are looking at the number of uh, people who are involved in digital and uh, who are using digital services plus 25% uh, before COVID, uh, after COVID uh, comparison. But not just the number of uh, uh, people who are much more open for that, but uh, and who are adopting uh, digitization in C, but also the breadth of the services and activities that they are doing digital, that's uh, increased uh, by close to 70% uh, in this uh, period of time. And one of the biggest uh, arguments that I have heard in uh, before COVID uh, in many of those countries was that we are not able to uh, catch up as quickly because uh, our population is not ready yet for the change. We need to wait. It will take some time until the next generation will grow up. And uh, that's when, uh, when we can really uh, get uh, get there. If you look at the more elderly population, the above 65 uh, years age population, 40% increase. So obviously COVID made it uh, possible, which was so, so to be not possible in this region before. So that's a huge opportunity which uh, we should grab, especially as we have a couple of components where we can uh, really base our uh, fundamentals on. We have had uh, some good uh, macroeconomic track record in the last uh, couple of years, the last 15 years uh, as a region. The gap compared to the western part of Europe uh, clearly shrinked in uh, uh, between us and uh, a bit between CE and uh, western part of Europe. And this is true for practically all the countries uh, in this group. Uh, there is an increasingly uh, vibrant uh, ecosystem, tech ecosystem, uh, which is uh, more and more visible uh, in this uh, in this region. And the quality of um, uh, of uh, the digital infrastructure is even better than in some of the Western European countries. That's also a little bit uh, uh, our past. Uh, and given by our past uh, starting point, we practically had nothing and uh, our telecommunications uh, uh, systems were completely underdeveloped and uh, we built most of the stuff uh, completely from scratch, uh, so it's in good shape. Um, and then there are two areas uh, within education, the primary and secondary education and higher education, where number of uh, our, our kind of uh, performance in uh, some of the important dimensions like uh, uh, in mathematics, physics, in, uh, in uh, uh, quant related topics that uh, was traditionally pretty strong. Uh, there, there's a, there is a, a big uh, mentioning here that we are losing a bit on this edge. So we have to extremely uh, carefully focus on education uh, in the, in the future, future years. Uh, but still, I would say that there is quite some things that we can build on. And uh, based on that, the question is uh, what 
we believe would need to be done or what are the key topics, the key discussion points that uh, we believe would be important to be covered uh, in when it comes to digitalization. And I think this is completely a list which uh, which is up for discussion in the uh, in the panel. But I think one very important message from our side that it has to come from at least three sources. So this is cooperation of public sector businesses and we cannot forget about the individuals. The public sector has to leverage the fact that uh, this region uh, and the collaboration within this region can make up uh, uh, a much more sizable uh, economic unit uh, from that perspective than just uh, the relatively small countries uh, around. And that's how uh, digital ecosystems uh, can be uh, supported and uh, and uh, made relevant also beyond uh, beyond the region. We also believe that accelerating the public services, the digital public services, that's a huge uh, driver that can educate uh, the population in all these countries. And this education then has a spillover effect uh, also on their works, uh, on their uh, other activities. And here again, COVID uh, taught us some uh, pretty important uh, lessons and uh, gave us some uh, unaspired uh, but uh, experiences uh, uh, given the given the global uh, pandemic that we all went through. And investing into the digital talent uh, to make sure that uh, we can, as I mentioned, uh, we can also keep up the pace uh, on the education front. In terms of businesses. Um, adopting the business models, I we actually did a survey, not just in Central Europe, but more globally. And the question was to the top executives of uh, leading organizations, uh, how much they believe they need to change uh, and adjust their business models in light of all the digital uh, uh, developments and innovations. And uh, there was 11% who said that uh, they believe that uh, their current business is uh, great and uh, will withstand uh, any challenges going forward, even without any major uh, interventions. So all the nine tenths of them, they were all absolutely convinced that uh, they have to go under major, um, uh, major rethinking of how how they uh, how they service customers, uh, how they organize their operating models, how they make them uh, much more flexible to be able to react uh, much faster to all different challenges. And for that, they will need their colleagues to be reskilled and uh, to upskill uh, to be able to then also deliver on all their new business uh, uh, model promises. And finally, individuals, we cannot forget about them and uh, they should also take their uh, fair share of that. I think it's uh, very clear by now that uh, lifelong learning, uh, it's uh, something that we all have to be uh, familiarizing with. Uh, we, did a, we did a report a couple of years back on um, also on Europe level, but then also in Hungary, like what do we expect in terms of uh, working places, how much they will be changed by digitization, by automation uh, over time. And uh, our estimation was, um, and that's uh, from a year or a year and a half ago, that in the next 10 years, if we take the example of Hungary, at least 50% of the, of the jobs will fundamentally change. So job descriptions will be very different from the ones they are today. So therefore, to make sure that uh, everyone is uh, rather developing skills and uh, pre is prepared for lifelong learning, that's something that uh, we find very important. Not to mention the fact that to, we also see a very important trend on how the global, uh, how, how the um, uh, workers market is getting really uh, globalized. So I have a couple of clients uh, in different countries uh, who, especially after COVID, started to complain how much uh, they lose some of their talents and not uh, for local jobs, but uh, for remote jobs to 
uh, other international uh, institutions from the other side of the planet. So it's, uh, I think it's a very clear uh, set of topics and uh, I think those individuals who are ready to implement uh, all these, then they will be very successful in the, in the global uh, job market. So that's what uh, we thought to have just as a quick starter. And I am sure that uh, given the composition of the panel, we will have uh, some exciting discussions uh, around that and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you, Levente, for the um, inter interesting uh, thoughts. Actually, we have a lot of food for thought. Um, uh, before we move on, actually, uh, to the panelists, I would like to engage a little bit with the audience. And I have only one question to you. And that is, um, do you think data matters to your business? Do you think data, data analytics, knowing more about anything that is data driven matters for your business? Hands up, please, who disagrees? You don't think, you don't think that data matters to your business? Then we have a job to prove. Who does think that data matters to your business? We have a unanimous vote here in the room. Uh, I didn't get to look at the screen. I do think that we have also a unanimous vote among, among our panelists. So what does it take to make a successful digital transformation? And I would like to start with Torbjörn. You, you showed some great statistics from your report earlier today on one avenue of US, one avenue in China, one avenue in Europe in between. But it's all about transformation and data. So over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to join the panel again. Uh, so I think we can all agree that data are today an increasingly important economic and strategic resource for businesses, for governments, and for basically any organization. But data in themselves are of limited value unless you do something with them. So in order to extract benefits from data and data flows, they need to be refined into what we call digital intelligence. And, and, and this is not always easy. And one of the reasons why the United States and China are so dominant in the digital data-driven economy is that they have the capabilities to leverage data for value creation and capture. And I already mentioned that this morning that, uh, you know, 90% of the market capitalization of the world's largest digital platforms, such as Microsoft, Google, Apple, Facebook, Alibaba, Tencent, and so on, are linked to US and China. This is a, a very unusual situation when you think about any sector of the, the world economy. We're used to talking about the rich North and the poor South. Here we're talking about the US and China and all the other countries are kind of followers at various speed and at various uh, levels. We see that if we can govern data and data flows well, and if we can ensure that more countries can strengthen their ability to harness data, and that when I say countries, it means people, it means governments, it means businesses, small and large, then data can really play a very powerful role in support of what we will pay attention to, namely sustainable development. Uh, but if we fail in these respects, then we think that the growing importance of data is likely to lead to widening inequalities in the world and greater divides. We're already seeing uh, expanding divides as a result of the COVID pandemic because countries are simply not able to take advantage of digital solutions as well as others. So uh, this is really uh, widening the divides. And it's against this background that we see a need for, for the world now to come together and to chart a way forward that enables more inclusive gains from data. This will be difficult, but it's still necessary as we think. How we deal with data will have significant implications for how the world will develop uh, in, the, in the coming decades. Thank you, Troy Byrne. Um, Chris, we talk about people at the end of the day. So what are the data capabilities that really matter at the moment? Uh, well, first of all, I think what, what Tor Torbjorn was mentioning here, the, the fact that the US and China are so dominant in this field, uh, I think that's partially re reflected by the fact that countries of that size have enormous data sets. So there's a lot to draw on. If you've got a machine learning model, 
uh, around the Chinese or the English language, you've got a lot to work with there. But I don't think that, that tells the full story. I think if you're a company of any size, if you're a country of any size, uh, I think a lot depends on the culture that you have in that, in that company or in that, in that, in that, uh, in that country. Uh, what do I mean by culture? Um, you know, what we see at Microsoft is that those companies who do succeed in creating a sort of business model where you actually bring to life things like rapid prototyping, design thinking, uh, a lean startup uh, approach to things, and on the development side you have a, a DevOps operation. So when you have, an, if you succeed in introducing a culture that encourages experimentation and trying out, uh, trying out a lot of things, uh, then you, you can actually, you can foster a culture where the business is, is using data a lot. Uh, at Microsoft, we talk about the democratization of AI. What do we mean by that? Um, we mean that uh, you know, for a business to be using data and AI tools, you don't just need a few you know, super genius uh, data scientists on board who know everything and nobody else really knows what, what they're doing. What we really try to put into practice is making AI just one of several tools that you can use within the cloud, within the Azure platform. Uh, we try to make those tools, tools available through things like Power Platform, Power BI, many, many of the people in the audience may be already familiar with that. But if you can make low code and no code uh, usage of AI type tools and data, and if you can introduce that widely enough in, in the company, and you manage to foster a kind of culture where people can experiment and try out new things, uh, then you, you start to develop a culture where, where data starts to actually drive the business. Thank you. Um, that, uh, the culture, part of the culture uh, can be that you have like a dedicated person who is driving the process for digital transformation. Uh, another question to the audience. Please, can you please raise your hands if your organization has a digital transformation officer or an innovation officer? We do. You do. Not that many. Everybody's a digital transformation officer. So maybe this is something for you to consider. Actually, Estonia is a country, but they have a national digital advisor. Um, and that shows that Estonia actually uh, has started uh, it quite early, like 30 years ago, and, um, and the past 20 years showed what digital transformation can really mean and how it accelerates um, their, their GDP growth at the end of the day. So Martin, um, what, does, uh, what do you think are the next steps for building a digital infrastructure for Estonia? So first things first, thank you for having me uh, in Budapest. Uh, unfortunately, couldn't, couldn't make there physically. But also would like to echo back uh, a few of the things that were said, mainly that the data itself doesn't uh, build value. Uh, we need to ask the right questions and build models on top of it. And also the point of uh, culture being the fundamental driver here. And uh, those 30 years of building a digital society here in Estonia have uh, taught us many lessons. And yes, main one is that uh, it's not about technology, it's not about the data, it's about building a culture and a mindset shift that is more adaptable and uh, thus flexible. Creating a space that is psych uh, psychologically safe so that in all levels of both organization and the society, uh, people feel that this culture of experimentation that was mentioned can happen in a trusted innovation environment. This basically means the collaboration of all stakeholders. So, but yes, uh, even in Estonia, we have realized that current uh, technological and governance architecture that we have been building uh, is not necessarily adequate enough to fit the 21st century. So for uh, about four to five years, we've been working on a new next level, next generation uh, governance architecture, both on a cultural uh, building side, uh, being, being meaning that we're building the community uh, 
around it, but also having a solid technological architecture or framework in order to do that. So what we mean by this shortly is that as we're all living in an age where uh, changes are occurring faster and faster, then we need to also build our system architecture in a way that can adapt faster. For technical nerds, this means domain-driven microservice ar architecture and uh, asynchronous messaging. But what that means in a human way, it means that we will be building up our whole governance system based on small modular Lego bricks uh, that are interoperable by design and they are reusable by design so that all of these different uh, processes and in the end the organizational culture can adapt to those changes on a regular routine basis uh, based on ag principles of agile governance for example why is this necessary because uh, again as the COVID pandemic has shown is that, of course, everybody uses digital stuff. But when the COVID hit, all of our physical infrastructure around us became obsolete. This means that we actually need to be able to change our business processes from a systemic level on the go in days, not in months or years after one or the other politician has come out with an idea. This kind of an idea of domain-driven, small modular pieces has been already also scaled to a global level by an initiative called GovStack, which is together with uh, ITU, uh, uh, German government, Estonia, and also the DIAL, Digital Impact Alliance. And UNCTAD also is, is a partner in the part of registries building block. Uh, then uh, these types of modular services actually uh, are becoming available as digital public co goods quite soon. And again, coming back to the data issue, these, these types of tools are needed to make sense of out of the data. Because if somebody around the world has asked the right question and has built some value on top of uh, data, then it's likely that many other bureaucratic institutions could do that as well. So hopefully these tools will help to build us actually a data economy that is sustainable, agile and constantly adaptable. Thank you. Um, we would like to zoom into one of the sectors which uh, actually in Hungary has been uh, very much driving a digital transformation. And um, I think it's fair to say that uh, the national banks uh, cloud recommendation and now the digital transformation recommendation are, set, are really setting the scene for other regulators uh, as well uh, globally, not only within Europe. Um, so what I wanted to ask uh, from you, Aniko, is that uh, what is the role of the regulators when it is about transformation and what are the boundaries? So when is it sort of too hard to push or is it rather the support and, um, and how do you see M MMBA's role in, in the transformation? So thank you for the question. Uh, I would start with uh, quoting one of the other very famous Estonian uh, expert on digitalization whom we could meet last week, Tavi Kota, who said that uh, digitalization has to come from the private sector because uh, the private sector provides much more uh, services than the public ones, so people can, can uh, demand for, for uh, development on, on this sector. But uh, actually in Hungary, we seem to have a different uh, uh, experience that uh, even though there is a strong, blue, strong push globally uh, towards digitalization, uh, here at the Central Bank of Hungary we felt that we might also become active to push the Hungarian financial sector towards more intense and more comprehensive digitalization because otherwise uh, they, they wouldn't feel the push enough. So that first uh, we, of course, uh, uh, dig-dived and uh, 
and made a very comprehensive uh, survey on the status of the digitalization of the Hungarian banking sector and based on the experiences of and evidence uh, collected and also the experiences of uh, personal interviews, we draw uh, conclusions and, and set up a very comprehensive digital transformation recommendation, which indeed, yes, it's a novelty worldwide and actually um, expect us to, to become uh, on the uh, similar string, stringency in regulation with Singapore, UK, and Israel uh, uh, in, in the standard, standard and poor evaluation. So uh, this, uh, this um, recommendation uh, aims to provide a minimum a set of requirements for the Hungarian banks uh, how and when to digitalize their the culture, first and foremost, their the management, their governance, and also, as you uh, mentioned, the overall innovative and digital culture inside the institutions. And of course, we want uh, uh, the banks to provide as many as possible uh, digital services uh, to customers, uh, most probably end-to-end -end digital services, and also to be able to provide this, we want them to modernize the data warehouses and also to use uh, the most cutting-edge technologies to, to learn from these database, databases and use uh, the immense uh, amount of data that they are sitting on uh, more uh, comprehensively and, uh, and treat this as an asset rather than a liability. Um, Chris, I know that you've been working on, uh, as Microsoft, you've been working on, with quite a few, I would call traditional banks. Um, to have them in the digital transformation. What are your takeaways and what will be the takeaways for the audience? Yeah, um, my experience of the, of the financial services sector, and I'm looking in from the outside in, in many ways, but I, I see similarities in, the, in FSI today. I see some similarities to what telecoms uh, lived through, let's say, at around the time that 4G was, uh, was, was, uh, was introduced. Uh, before 4G, uh, I'm sure many people here still remember, you know, doing data on your mobile phone was, it was a novelty, it was, it was still kind of cool, but it really didn't deliver the full functionality of, of, you know, the full potential of mobile data. As soon as operators launched 4G, uh, this enabled a whole new class of disruptors. Uh, so there were, uh, there were some like Skype uh, in Estonia also has a slight Microsoft history, but you had people like uh, WhatsApp and Viber, and a lot of these voice over IP players seemed to come out of nowhere and to basically eat away in a very short period of time uh, a lot of the telecom operators' uh, voice traffic. This happened very, very quickly, not in years, not in, in months, in a matter of weeks, uh, at least the operator that I ran, uh, you know, saw the effect of this, and we felt it on our own skin. And for us, this disruption was was the real driver for serious digitalization. I think up to that point, uh, we we'd made a few digitalization attempts, but uh, you know, there is a, an English expression: "Shit got real." <laughs> uh, when we really started to lose serious market share, uh, and once we did that the whole attitude towards investing in digitalization, towards actually putting resources into it, that, that changed completely. I see the, 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 the period that we're living in for financial services right now, I see it as somewhat similar. Uh, when you have uh, some, some players out there that I see as quite similar to, uh, to WhatsApp or Viber, these are, these are companies like TransferWise or Revolut, uh, these present real serious market-based challenges uh, and uh, I think, you know, that kind of disruption and shock, that's, that's going to be a real trigger for, uh, for the kind of cultural change and actual business model change uh, that has to come through the digitalization effort in, in FSI. 
I, I saw on the screen that at least Laventa and Martin got very active when you mentioned disruptor and disruptor is a new entrance to the market. And I know that the Onico also has, has as, the, as does the central bank, has views of, of Revolut. So um, maybe we start with, uh, with you, Martin. You, you seem to sort of be, become really live at that point. So yeah, uh, I heard at least two Estonian companies, uh, namely Skype and Transfermise, mentioned uh, uh, by previous speakers. One of those uh, main, again, lessons learned, and the previous question also was that what's the role of the regulator in this game? And the role of the regulator is to create the safe room where this innovation can happen, and uh, both on a legal way and, and also in a cultural way, and currently, Estonia has probably the most unicorns per capita. And also, uh, latest statistics came out, we have the biggest equity uh, funding uh, to, to do towards uh, private sector. But these are all, and I true also uh, agree with uh, last week's Stavi Gotkas, uh, the former CIO's uh, point that innovation truly happens within the private sector. Uh, I've been, unfortunately, I haven't, been able to show you the beautiful streets of Tallinn during this uh, panel because it's raining. But uh, these corridors where I'm moving in, uh, this is the main governmental building of, of Estonia, our prime minister works here. And this is not the place where innovation happens. <laughs> and nor is the corridors of ministers where innovation happens. Innovation happens in, in, in by serendipitous encounters of different gut feelings. In Estonia, it's likely to happen in a kitchen or a sauna, probably in the street, <laughs> maybe in a cafe, but not necessarily these kind of governmental corridors. But what governments can do is create the environment uh, in those streets, in those kitchens, the, 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 the trust around that, so that these serendipitous encounters may be people who made Skype, TransferWise, Bolt, or, or many others can mix and mingle and also have the ability to actually fulfill their dreams and, and things that they're really good at. And usually it might not be declaring taxes. This is not their main business. Their business is actually to disrupt the market, to come up with new ideas and also to deploy them globally. Thank you. Levente, you, you wanted to add something? Yes, maybe just... Uh very briefly, so I, I cannot uh, uh, disagree with anything what has been said. Uh, uh, I think it's still very, very important, uh, the framework uh, that is created uh, for innovation. So, uh, and I think we can, maybe today's panel is not long enough to uh, really go into all the depths of the Estonian uh, uh, performance that everyone is now uh, looking at, uh, really like best best practice in terms of how a country could uh, digitalize itself uh, uh, so efficiently. Uh, and But if, if I look back, I think that also started with some, some good uh, uh, decisions, uh, which partially came from the public sector in a sense to create the framework and the opportunity for that. So I think that this is still something that I think it's very important uh, for, uh, for also for other countries to follow. And that's why I think it's great also what uh, just has been said before uh, on the banking sector, because I think that's uh, clearly the sector uh, which is uh, the next one uh, to undergo, already undergoing, but to undergo uh, dramatic changes. And uh, it's not just, uh, I think that uh, like a couple of years ago, all the banks uh, looked at their local competitors uh, right now. Uh, they have to look at their global competitors, who are not always just banks, as it has been said, but uh, tech companies and uh, digital ecosystems. And even more challenging is, uh, and I think with the COVID impact here would be also very important uh, uh, further shaper, is the rising customer expectations, uh, which they, uh, they uh, need to match. And uh, I think to make sure also from regulatory perspective to trying to push uh, uh, the market into that direction. I think that's uh, that's something uh, which makes a lot of sense. Tjörbjörn, um, public or private sector? Um, we, you, 
we heard about both and the roles of both the public and private sector when it is about transformation. In the report, I saw roles for both of them. And maybe if we can swim to another sector, uh, due to the pandemic, everybody is interested at the moment in healthcare. So I thought that let's, let's do healthcare as the second sector that we discuss. Um, can you just tell me a little bit about uh, the work, for example, in less developed countries and how actually there, due to the pandemic, we can start via the healthcare an avenue for digital transformation? Well, I think the, the pandemic uh, has taught us and taught the world very important lessons in relation to policy and data interactions and the role that uh, data can play in fighting global crisis. And never have, uh, I think, people's lives been so dependent on access to real-time data and technology from monitoring and controlling the spread of the pandemic and the way we carry out our daily activities, such as working, studying, shopping, etc., uh, to the manner through which scientists have been able to develop new vaccines in record time. This is all reflecting on, on data in one way or another. And I think enhanced access to and use of digital data, they raise kind of both hopes and concerns. On the one hand, the sharing of health data globally has been critical for coping with the consequences of the pandemic and for the development of the vaccine. On the other hand, we have seen doubts in connection to the respect of, for privacy and other human rights as a factor limiting the use of some of the contact tracing digital applications that have been introduced by governments to help in fighting COVID-19 contagion. And I think this kind of illustrates the, the multidimensionality of data it generates so many different uh, triggers um, from, uh, from the individual's uh, concern over how their data are being used and to how governments want to have access to data from their citizens to be able to control um, and from a business's ability to transform their, their, uh, their activities, their business models and so on to, to make a better job. Now, if you turn this attention then to the least developed countries, they are lagging behind in so many respects. They lag in terms of the quality of the infrastructure, in terms of skills, uh, ability among people to use digital technologies, uh, the extent to which businesses are digitalized, uh, the extent to which they have data protection policies in place, consumer protection policies in place. Uh, many, uh, half of African countries, for instance, they do not have data protection policies in place, which is a crucial thing to, to uh, increase the trust among people to actually um, uh, engage with, online with, uh, with data. So I think uh, if we really want to see how the world as a whole can take advantage of data, we need to address some of the root problems in the poorer countries in this area. Uh, it's very impressive to see what Estonia can, can do. Uh, but in order for the poorer countries to really tag on here, it, uh, it will need the GovStack uh, knowledge. It's a brilliant example of how we can help by coming together to try to solve a global good and uh, develop a global good. But we need to work in a much broader, holistic uh, way to really make sure that all countries are able to, to come into this data-driven economy. Martin, we heard so much about Estonia as an example. Uh, can you tell us how Estonia is um, transforming the healthcare sector and maybe an example that can be a learning for all of us? So first and foremost, uh, uh, the things that Torbjörn just mentioned is the truly big thing. Because what we've uh, also realized here in Estonia and I'll come to the point of healthcare and, and education just a wee bit time, is also that um, when you are digitalizing a society, then uh, doing, in Estonia, for example, having been doing this for 25 years, uh, even more, then we have more or less solved all of the easy problems. Like, for example, automating taxis, yes, it took one very talented guy about uh, eight years to do it, but it's still about automating one Excel sheet or like a network of them. It's doable. But if you have already 99% of uh, government services online available 24-7, then the problems 
become much, much more difficult. It's similar to, uh, for example, I don't know, uh, training an AI algorithm where 95% accuracy might be doable, but 99.999, like that's a challenge. Or similar, like with COVID pandemic and vaccinations, doing 60 to 70% of population is easy, but getting the less involved is much more difficult. But in terms of healthcare and, and, and education, we are ta basically taking the similar type of an approach. Uh, together with the GovStack initiative and the WHO, we also have initiated a, a spin-off, uh, which is basically Health Stack. Uh, this is an initiative that also has the private sector in it, uh, IBM and, and many others, uh, but also many governments involved. Uh, it's, a, it's an initiative that uh, is starting up. And together with the government of India and, and, and also Singapore, we're also uh, investigating into uh, building a global educational stack. Similar to the idea that I was explaining before, uh, that we need to basically go through and agree on the basics. How to, can we actually, what does it mean to have identity? What does it mean to have registry? What does it mean to have distant learning or telemedicine? agree upon those principles in a globally and transparent way and then also build solutions on top of it which will be digital public goods in estonia we have been experimenting but it's also due to the kind of maturity uh, we started the educational part or the whole digital journey started in in schools and and getting getting every school online and getting computers to classes but uh, it's in reality uh, it's it's still about uh, doing it step by step and also meanwhile we are building our own ecosystem we want to contribute back through initiatives like govstack or health stack or, or things like that chris you and i were discussing in a break uh, that the, both of us are quite fascinated on um, what are the uh, possibilities that healthcare and ai mean well, I, uh, l l let me just start by reinforcing what Torburn was saying earlier. Um, I think you know we're living through a difficult period because of the, the COVID-19 virus, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure it's, it, it really has sunk in for a lot of people just how extraordinary uh, the situation we have today, that we have vaccines that have been developed in absolute record time. And one of the main factors that vac vaccines have been able to de be developed and tested uh, in this amount of time is because of the availability of, of vast amounts of data, our ability to process and, uh, and, and analyze that data has increased several fold uh, by a couple of orders of magnitude. If you compare this to the, to the last really big pandemic that we've experienced uh, around us. So I think the, the fact that, uh, that this has happened exactly during this period when we've uh, had an explosion in big data technology, AI technology, the ability to transmit this data pretty much anywhere. I think that's, it's kind of a lucky break uh, mm -hmm. that we're able to do that um, and we should really appreciate that. Now having said that, I think healthcare also is a very unique sector because it is one of those sectors where, um, you know, very frequently, uh, you know, we have medicines to, you know, when we've identified a specific condition, you know, we've developed, the, the way medicines have been, have been developed up to this point have been to target, uh, you know, small groups of people, small groups of cases, and work carefully to identify one single medicine or treatment that can be developed for one particular identifiable condition or disease. Um, I think what is, is happening now is there's an explosion in availability of data, whether that comes from, uh, I don't know, a, a smart body scale that you might have at home. Uh, maybe your mobile telephone, maybe your watch uh, can provide this, but there's an explosion in the amount of data that is available from everything from MRIs to x-rays to, to sim simple metrics of, of your body. This explosion in, in data in uh, healthcare, I think, is going to make possible uh, the ability to sift through 
a lot of different, uh, let's say, isolated uh, sources of data, and it will enable the healthcare sector to work on a, a, a large number of things simultaneously, um, and it will be able to use machine learning to help people uh, prevent, uh, to, 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 to do prevention, not just treatment in healthcare. So I think we stand on the, on the verge of, a, of an explosion in our capabilities uh, when it comes to what's, what can be done in healthcare. And I think uh, the, 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 the sort of the visible outcomes that can, that can, uh, that can arise from that, I think they could, uh, they could really surprise us over the next few years. Yeah, and um, as a lawyer, um, if I may just add one point, it's um, that the pandemic was probably the first example when I saw that actually a re not a national but a regional or even global regulatory action uh, led to accelerating a successful story, and that was that uh, without all the support for making the data available for the vaccine production. And that wasn't only within the Euros, Euro, within Europe, but lots and lots of regulators actually really uh, made a little bit easier the cooperation, even cooperation among competitors, which is very rare. Uh, that helped actually in uh, the development. And that is something which I saw pretty much the first time in my career, that regulators acting so fast to, a, to an absolutely uh, overarching demand. Um, with this, we arrived actually to the last five minutes of our, of our panel discussion, which is a very sad uh, fact. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, this, but what I would like to ask uh, from our panelists, if you can sort of provide the audience with a little bit of uh, recommendation. Um, where do you see the biggest risk are, and how would you suggest they start their own digital transformation journey? Um, who would like to start? Oh, I see big silence. Then I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to have to choose. Uh, Levante, are you up for starting? I'm, I'm happy to. I'm happy to start. You. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Maybe just one uh, half sentence to the healthcare topic. I just cannot uh, uh, withdraw that. The, I think one extremely important question there is uh, which are the countries or uh, ecosystems that open up uh, healthcare data, obviously under uh, legal and other scrutiny, but open up anonymized uh, healthcare data for, for research and innovation for for different uh, healthcare ventures and uh, startups. And we can see a couple of good examples for that. Uh, but this is perhaps something within that uh, industry which can really lead to uh, leapfrogging uh, in, uh, in in respective areas. But now closing on that, uh, so what I would uh, uh, suggest, so I mean, what we see, and uh, we see large organizations, uh, and we see uh, both public sector and uh, and private organizations. What I think is a key uh, to have uh, a very important uh, leader for uh, for for this type of change. So I have uh, not seen any successful, uh, very successful organization from digitization or or advanced uh, analytics data perspective, who did not came to a conclusion sooner or later that uh, there needs to be someone uh, who has uh, enough empowerment in the organization, who has uh, enough uh, uh, power in the organization to uh, to lead this, because uh, all organizations have so many different uh, agendas. So that's, uh, that's number one. Number two is uh, that it cannot obviously just be on the top, but you need to empower uh, the uh, people around, and uh, you need to build uh, capabilities which uh, uh, which enable uh, your uh, colleagues to uh, to really uh, progress on that one. I really like the example of Martin that uh, some of these uh, innovative ideas are not born uh, in offices, but uh, you really need. Uh, in the space uh, for people to uh, to do that. And then finally, what we see in many cases, and, and now I, I'm intentionally not talking about all the technology parts, I leave that to Chris, but uh, com communicating about uh, that change, uh, I think that's uh, something what 
uh, in some organizations, they tend to forget about it. And uh, while this is extremely important uh, factor for large organizations that then really change and uh, and uh, have a clear change story ahead of uh, and, and a vision for the entire organization and each and every member to really go into the same direction. Thank you, Levante. Who would like to continue? So Amico? I would oh, okay, uh, like to uh, follow on Levante's footsteps and uh, walking in this corridor where I would say that innovation uh, cannot happen. I'll take you to see my father, is this guy. I've been working in the corridor where my, in an institution which my father created in the end of the, uh, in the beginning of the re-independence of Estonia. And continuing on Levante's idea, Estonia is opening up its certainized and anonymized uh, health data sets. We have digitalized all of our health system since 2008, so we do have the data. And what was mentioned before is that we are currently have about 18 narrow AI use cases in the public sector, which already are providing value, both financially in terms of millions of euros saved every year because of having more automatization in governmental processes, but mainly the AI is, will, is providing better quality of services for the people. And that's the main thing. We can actually serve our citizens better via the use of data, but also, as kind of I've been trying to mention the whole time, is that this, these efforts cannot be done alone. So in many of those global discussions, People get stuck in technical details which are totally irrelevant. This is about actually understanding the trust, understanding the practical use case, why we need to do it, and building upon that. The language different people speak is a technical and irrelevant issue. If we have the trust, if we have the use case, we can actually build global standards on top of it. And this is the main lesson learned. Again, it's not about the technology nor the data. It's about building culture, mindset, and trust within the community, and in this case, the global or the EU community. Thank you. Aniko. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, we at the Central Bank are not, uh, not uh, taking over the innovation from the financial sector. We are just uh, showing them some directions where they were trying to go, and we are also attracting and uh, stimulating the fintechs as a challengers to also uh, um, create a market competition for the benefit of the customers. And um, so, but still there are some limits what we can do and what, what the financial sector do without uh, having access to further uh, public uh, sector data. So what do I mean? Uh, all, all these digital financial services would be uh, more targeted, more, uh, more punctual if the banks would have access to, for example, credit history data uh, without limits if they would have access to collateral data, if the uh, data on energy efficiency of the um, individual apartments would be available, the financial services uh, could better serve the real needs of the customers. Not, not it's, they wouldn't serve the benefits of the banks themselves, but, but the customers at the end. So these are, uh, at, for the moment, the risks that um, that uh, our goals couldn't be realized if if these uh, if these conditions uh, prevail. So I, I would really be sitting here next year and report on more advancement on this field. Thank you, Aniko, and we will take you up on that hopefully. Thorben. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'll be very brief, and uh, I think uh, it, it's an interesting uh, journey and discussion here because we're talking from the very micro what you can do at the level of a business, and then you talk about what you can do at the level of a government. 
And I think uh, when it comes to the uh, governance of data as we move forward in, uh, into the future, I think the data challenge is very similar to uh, dealing with climate change and pandemics. We're going to need a global response in order to develop appropriate data governance frameworks. It will not be possible for any individual country to solve these problems alone. We need to find ways to get interoperability between national regulatory systems and that are developed in such a way that they take into account all the different dimensions of data. And here I think um, uh, our strongest message is really to bring the different stakeholders, the different disciplines together and start an serious dialogue about how to ensure that we generate a data-driven world that this doesn't leave anyone behind. Thank you so much. Thank you, Theo Brennan. Chris? Yeah, so I probably won't create any surprises here, but I think uh, you know, advice for any, any private or public organization, whatever the size, I think is, you know, first of all, recognize that you have a lot more data at your disposal than you may you may think and for that reason if you're managing any any entity like this you should be working on trying to digitize as many processes as many things going on in your company as possible uh, you know my wife runs a cafe and a restaurant and she didn't really take digitization very seriously until she was taking a lot of orders from NetPinsir and Volt during the crisis. And when she saw the kind of analytic capabilities that you could get from working with these entities, that was a trigger for her. It wasn't me. I wasn't the trigger. <laughs> that was the trigger for her to start thinking, woof, I've really got to figure out how to dig digitalize this, this information uh, source that I'm getting to help me order things I need for a certain day of the week, a certain time of the day. Uh, that's what it means to become a data-driven organization, whatever your size. I think uh, at, a, at a higher level, I think you really do need to try to, uh, to, to create this culture of data creation, of experimenting, of trying things out, of failing fast. Uh, I th really do think these are more than buzzwords. Uh, rapid prototyping, design thinking, these are not just buzzwords. These really are ways to run your business, and they have their full value when you are fueling these ideas uh, with actual data that you can action in real time. So I could probably come up with a, a number of other pieces of advice, but I think, I think those are, are the two most important things, and those are primarily cultural uh, things rather than that. The technology tip tells you how, but it doesn't tell you what. Thank you. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, any questions from the audience to any of our distinguished panelists? Yes, please. I would like to ask uh, Microsoft, as I believe they have a lot of teaching activities. They are supporting schools and mm -hmm. kids all over the world. And you also mentioned that artificial intelligence is one of the tools that we are going to use for uh, any future. Yep. What do you think when it's time for kids to learn I honestly don't think there's a lower limit. There are, there are more complex and more simple ways to teach these concepts. Uh, I don't think these concepts are out of the reach of even primary school children. So uh, I think all of us can, can cite examples where our kids uh, surprise us and they know more than, than, than we think they do and sometimes they know more than we do. Uh, so I, I don't think there really is a, uh, a lower limit. Okay, maybe Ovoda. Uh, okay, maybe that's, it's too early to talk about a digitalish Bülchöde, but, uh, but you know, I think primary, the primary level is, is not too soon. Thank you, any other questions? Okay, if I, I see no more questions. So I would like to wrap up in basically summarizing a little bit of what happened today. Um, one of the biggest takeaways for me is that how much I heard about the culture today, uh, the culture of innovation, the culture of data creation, the culture role change that is necessary both in the public and the private sector among regulators and also for individuals. 
Um, the second takeaway is that those entities who don't have a CIO or a, data transfer or a digital transformation officer, I think it's high time that you appoint one because we have evidence from across the panel that this is one of the first steps that you can take to accelerate the process and to benefit the most. Uh, public or private sector together uh, will be the real solution. So it's not about public or private sector, not about regulators only or businesses only. So we have a job, we're in this together really, and it affects all of our lives. So I do think that um, all of us in this room, in the garden, in this building or through across the globe, really, literally across the globe, as we see this panel, have something to do with the future of us and also the future of the next generations. Um, and I love the fact that Jorber mentioned global uh, response and global responsibility. Um, this, this pandemic has shown how global responsibility really is, has, how, how, how every issue can become very fast, a global issue, and how we have really a global responsibility uh, to, to bring uh, the less developed countries with us on journeys. How lucky we are here in Europe, actually, to be benefiting from over 90% internet usage and the phones that we have. Um, so I do think that we need, to, we need to think global and act local in everything that we do. Uh, so I would like to thank to my fellow, fellow panelists for the very inspiring discussion. I'm Dora Petrani, Managing Director, Central Eastern Europe for CMS. This is a law firm and not the contract management software operation. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, have a nice rest of the day, have a nice rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you for my fellow panelists as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.